live. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Chris, and this is the fifth day of our one-week live events. This series of interviews is part of the Italian Ministry for the Environment's Initiative Agenda, All for Climate, which aims to promote 2021 as the year of climate ambition in view of the pre-COP26. For those who are listening, first, thank you for your participation. You are free to share this event with your friends and most importantly, to write your questions in the comment section. We will share them with our guest during the interview or in the last 10 minutes. Today, we have the pleasure to talk with Sven. So thank you, Sven, for being here with us. It's an honor. So Sven is finding and implementing systemic climate solution, starting from what actually needs to be done. And his mission is to solve climate change. Um, so would you start, I would start with asking you to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us what is your vision and your mission in fighting climate change. Also, you can share your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot, Christian. Well, again, it's uh, really an honor to, to be with you. And, um, um, and in these extraordinary times we live in, right? Because there's uh, humanity has been growing in numbers over the last 200,000 years. And right now, 20th, 20th century, we really boomed the number of people on the planet, right? Till from a billion to now 7 billion, going on 10 billion. It's really a historic moment. And within this historic moment, now we're on a critical turning point because these are the 10 years that might decide how our climate reality might unfold or for future generations. And also this curve of, of, of humanity growing, it's actually turning. It's turning toward, it's slowing down. And we are the generation that are who are starting to re realize that, we feel that, we feel that we need collaboration more than ever and connection in order to change that climate reality at this pivotal moment in time. So it's real great to be with you and to see you as a uh, uh, bunch of uh, uh, current leaders. I would not, not say future leaders, but current leaders are taking, uh, taking the initiative in it. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. And I think that as young people also, we, we feel the, the responsibility to do something against climate change. And it's also a pleasure to see that we are sharing this view and this vision with other people such as you, which are doing, who are doing an amazing job with the climate cleanup. So what is it, what, what is climate cleanup and why did you decide to commit to such an ambitious project? Yeah, great. Um, so we are people reversing climate change, firstly. And um, I'll just show you a, a one minute explanation that kind of gives you the feel of what and how we are doing that. And it's called double nature. By now, we all have a clear vision of what impact climate change has on our planet. Pushed by the Paris Agreement, the energy transition is here to stay. But even in the best case scenario, we still have an abundance of 1500 gigaton of CO2. It took us humans 150 years to release it and we need to take it out as soon as possible. 1500 gigaton is difficult to imagine, but what about this? That's the same amount as is already stored by all plants and trees on Earth right now, on land and in the oceans. Oh. And did we forget to tell? That's because nature grows from CO2. So the challenge is clear. To clean up 1500 gigaton, we only have to double nature. True, that sure is a huge challenge, but it can still be done. And often it's even a viable business case. And people like challenges, right? This one is energizing, that's a promise. The fact is, it must be done. And the good news is, it's already happening. Let's double nature.
So we started from really the realization that there is a deep, deep crisis, right? And this is not always easy. And for me, this turned um, what you could call a climate depression turned around after realizing uh, three things. First, um, because when I when I am you know in, in in a big problem, maybe you have. I don't know, family members who are, who are sick or whatever. And what you do, uh, some people just start reading because you want to know everything. I'm, I'm one of those people. So I started uh, uh, um, because I'm, I, I just love uh, systems sciences uh, um, and complex system sciences. So it's something I could bring to the table and, and, and political science and, and, and theater and also business. I thought, what can we do? Um, and especially when reading Tim Flannery's work and later Paul Hawken, I started realizing three things. And we were with, with the group at that time. We need to do two things to actually reverse climate change. You know, um, reduce emissions. Uh, but there's, a, there's one other thing. We should also remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And at this time, like a couple of years ago, not many people were working on that. On that. And we thought, why? because this changes the narrative from doing less to doing more. And I'll explain why. Uh, and we set to go, you know, if this is need, what needs to be done, then we can make the decision to go and do it. And that's what we did. So we decided to go and do it, to set a goal, to remove. So how much do we need to remove then while re reducing emissions? 1500 gigatons. How much is 1500 gigatons? Then just explained, uh, 1500 gigatons is um, the amount of carbon dioxide currently contained in nature. And the second thing we realized was nature can, with nature, we can still do this. It still can be done. And this was very much science-based. So, so with drawdowns work, but also others like Griscom here, who says uh, nature represents at least... 37% of the solution, so up to 40% in for 2030 this is, and receives just 3% of investments. So there's a huge opportunity as well for what may be a whole new economy. Uh, and we realized that nature already contains 1500 gigatons. So if you look around me, um, I'll just stop the share for a second and just show you where we are. In, um, in Hilversum, in the middle of the Netherlands, in um, uh, one of Napoleon's farmer, former camping sites, to be honest, uh, nature can still do it. Um, so we need to reconnect with nature and learn from nature. And thirdly, we realized that there's actually people already working on these issues. So it's not a new idea. People are already doing it and actually they're often very old ideas. And these climate innovators are already showing the world that removing the carbon dioxide with nature can be done because they're doing it. They've begun, like here you see Joost Wouters seaweed, seaweed site, a uh, seaweed company who uh, in Ireland, this is a plot where it's just, um, uh, and the opportunities for seaweeds to uh, sequester carbon dioxide, uh, CO2 are huge, but also to bring back life in the oceans to provide feed, uh, food and feedstock, to provide energy, to provide um, uh, sources for materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, so uh, we need to remove uh, carbon as well as uh, stop emissions. Nature can still do it, and climate innovators have uh, already begun. So we thought, if this is the case, then. Let's look for those scalable science-based data-driven uh, uh, analysis. Let's look for those scalable and regenerative uh, methods. Uh, as we see na say now, trees, sand, and seaweed. And I'll just show you three entrepreneurs working on these issues. Uh, I told you about Joost. One, Philippe with a really big group of uh, regenerative farmers making regenerative farming uh, mainstream. Um, uh, re regenerative agroforestry to be precisely so uh, that's farming with trees as an integral uh, um, uh, coherent uh, part uh, uh, or, or whole 
And um, our role then as climate cleanup is to identify roadblocks, to uh, actually go to all, to all those innovators and say, what do you need? And collectively go and do it because we can't do it alone, you know? So we go to the people who are actually on the ground, who are actually doing the work, and we, we think they are the heroes of this new nature economy. Uh, second, Eric Metzner, the oldest um, uh, natural climate solution there is. It's called rock weathering of olivine, for example. Um, and they are just went, so, so olivine is this mineral. It's just a rock. You can, uh, I might have some rocks here. Uh, olivine is a special kind of rock. It's um, uh, half of the Earth's crust consists of olivine. So there's loads of it, it's ex which makes it extremely scalable as a solution. Just grind it up and it will react with carbon dioxide. Already a gigaton a year is being taken out by nature and we can strengthen nature and take out gigatons of carbon dioxide. And a gigaton is a lot. Eh? It's an ice cube one by one kilometer that uh, has the weight of gigaton, uh, 1500 gigatons. Uh, 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 here you see we need to take out, and here you see the potential uh, medium median uh, estimate for uh, enhanced weathering, which is double this 1500 gigaton goal. So we are super enthusiastic uh, uh, about this potential, and we then very scientifically we uh, uh, so we funded and identified research. And the third, uh, the seaweed solutions. I mentioned them. This is another. A hero of the new nature economy, Nikki Spill, who just went out there and started her seaweed farm. You know, just go out there. And um, with uh, with her and others, with the seaweed uh, uh, crew, you might say we have been um, field testing solutions in the uh, Caribbean last year uh, because there was a kind of there's a kind of seaweed that we don't have to grow because it's already growing there. Uh, it's called sargassum seaweed, and there's a huge problem actually. And we uh, we are looking right now to turn that problem into a solution because uh, uh, this um, seaweed already sequestered carbon and maybe we can take it uh, uh, down in the ocean or we can make materials or make energy out of it or other stuff. So it's three climate innovators and uh, then with them we run a technical cycle. Really imagine what it will, will look like in 10 years. Um, really start doing so this is why we went to the Caribbean and, 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 and we have our um, uh, uh, olivine uh, um, beach in Amsterdam, which you can visit and all. So we need to really get our hands on it. And, we need, and then finally, we need to make sure that we counter for the fundamental conditions because nature grows uh, not in a centralized way. Right, nature grows distributedly. So the only way we can scale fast is to distribute, multiply ourselves, multiply solutions and grow distributedly. And, and in order to have a system grow in that way, you need to uh, fix the fundamental conditions, just like a gardener sets the fundamental conditions. He doesn't take a tape and, uh, and tacks and, and glue and, and makes a plant, right? He sets the conditions so the plant starts growing. So that's what we need to do also for an economy. Um, and there you come to the to the carbon dilemma, perhaps. So here, this could be a climate landscape with all stuff growing, sequestering carbon dioxide, and also growing this new economy. And there's um, front runners like, in this case, Microsoft, who uh, uh, are setting goals now to remove their carbon uh, uh, emissions. To, uh, to become carbon negative and we say uh, don't become carbon negative become climate positive and start building this economy uh, with, with our sector to grow this sector as an ecosystem uh, in order to remove those 1500 gigatons and um, uh, the ways we're doing that is by connecting people into um, into a club the 1500 club there's still some uh, uh, some room uh, if you want to uh, help out uh, and to bring all those innovators uh, together in, a, in an ecosystem as a family. And then we're not alone in telling this because that's the good thing. The, the economic opportunities uh, seem to be real. And World Economic Forum is even, uh, actually talking about them now and has been doing research quite recently where they came to this 
staggering number that the new nature economy could generate up to 10.1 trillion uh, in annual business business value by 2030 per year so that's not um, as we uh, say in Dutch small beer <laughs> that's a that's serious business so investing in there now uh, will um, uh, give us the jobs of the future uh, will give us um, uh, uh, actually the tools we need to build an economy that will store carbon instead of emit it, that will regenerate the world instead of killing it, that in the end will bring back life instead of um, ending it. So um, we, feel we get a lot of energy from uh, collaborating uh, with a group of uh, climate innovators. One of our successes was to um, published Drawdown in the Netherlands and, and with other European countries, we set up a research center called Drawdown Europe Research, Research, Research Association. And we're working with a lot of partners and some of them you see here. Um, this was, and this all emerged in the last, like the club was a year old in the last two, three years. And here you see our, our team, our board and some members of the um, 1500 club um that's who we are that's who we what we do um and every everyone is really really welcome uh, to join in whatever way you want um at climatecleanup.org you can see what we're doing what's next oh that's other stuff we can go to that later uh onkra um yeah so that's what we do and we all we have uh, our main job these days is to actually to be the accountants of the new nature economy because we think that um, bookkeepers you might say bookkeepers might save the world yeah that that's amazing what you're doing and what i find really interesting is that you are talking in a kind of proactive and positive way because you're not talking about stop climate change or fight climate change you are talking about regenerate it you are talking about reversing it so why do you think is it so useful to communicate this issue with such positivity? Oh, because um, uh, negativity will uh, lead you to uh, wanting to end your life, right? And that's not, uh, uh, and if, you, if you're not alive, then you're not very active, uh, uh, effective as an agent. And I'm not even kidding. It's, it's serious stuff. Um, research shows Quite seriously, last week we spoke to Per Esma Stockness, who is like, like the world, I think the world's best climate psychologist uh, and an economist, by the way. And research now shows that facts don't get people into action. Um, it's the other way around. By doing, you start understanding the facts. So... This is why doing is so pivotal. We, you, we must dare to dream imagination. Then we start doing Im immediately as, as much as we can. I mean, doing can always also be drafting like a law article or, 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 or doing political work. Or that, that's, but we must start, start doing. Um, it's the only way to cope with a, with, a, um, uh, with a threat that's so severe, that's so big, and that's been so... Uh, so existential and it goes so much back to our core um, uh, identities basically because what do we see what do we hear stop flying how how nice is that you know people apart from uh, uh, some people in the green bubble the big 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 majority just wants to go out there to have a holiday and they really like to take the plane so you say okay one of the best things when you've got free time and when you've done so much of hard work when you want to have a holiday you can't do that oh barbecue by the way if you want to have a barbecue you can't do that if you want to have a hot shower to be you know you you cannot do if you you cannot do it so all the things that are really important for people if you you know you want to have your house uh, 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 have a warm house no you can't really do that make it colder so it's it's a terrible message it's a terrible message and then they combine that with the doom uh, messages we hear 
so it's much uh so it's it's in, in actually a quite impossible message and and uh and the other way if you start think okay what happens when we start growing our new economy you know the old econ economy was based on old plants fossil fuels new economy is based on well what you see around here new plants of course i mean everything we can do, do thing we can do with oil we can do with new plants as well it's the same molecules and we can use the sun as an energy energy source and we're getting much much better at that very very fast now you know the the solar panels are, are just, just the price of solar energy and again and again like moore's law for for uh, transistors and computers so um so there's growing, there, so energy is uh, becoming cheaper and cheaper right from the sun, like nature grows. We start growing the, um, the resources for our new nature economy. Like we can build houses from, from trees, from wood, from, from hemp, from other materials, and let's do that. So what then happens is we get an image of a much, much nicer world, of a beautiful world instead of an image of us doing less and less and less and getting cold and bored and you know and being bad all the time no we can be agents for positive change it's the only way only way to get us out of this and yeah. um yeah that's it i think it was quite clear from from the video you showed us which was amazing and really motivating so so thank you also for that uh, and i was yeah, thank willing you. Yeah. If you allow oh. me, this has been made by our members, um, uh, or two actually, a couple of our, our members, by uh, Philippa, uh, Philippa, uh, Philippa Collin and uh, Jeppe Pruijsen, and I really want to thank them for doing that. Those, those yeah. kind of amazing things start happening, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's really their work. Yeah, I wanted to ask you the, the motivation that pushed you to, to do such an activity, so how Climate Cleanup uh, was born? Uh, how did the idea came up to you? Um, well, there was this real, realization really, so hey, we have to take it out when, when reading Tim's plan we work. And then I, I thought, what, what if, I, if I give him a call or whatever? And, and I, I, I was very nervous, I sent him an email. So Tim Flannery is like um, uh, Al Gore meets, um, uh, uh, meets David Attenborough kind of person, but he lives in Australia. So over there, uh, and, and some in in, in like, uh, circles, uh, green circles, he's well known, but not with the general public in in uh, in, uh, in, in in Europe. Uh, he's, he's like really celebrated. Contact him. This was this Mr. Tim Fleming. And um, so it turned out I sent him an email that he was in Geneva and then with Joost Wouters, the seaweed entrepreneur, uh, three years ago now, I just went over there. Um, very, um, uh, uh, very hypocrite, uh, as a climate hypocrite as I am, we took the plane and uh, flew uh, to, um, uh, oh, okay, and we flew to... Um, Yeah, um, uh, we flew to uh, to Jennifer. Can you hear me still? Is this better? Yeah. yeah now it's better. Yeah. Okay. I'm in the same place. It's just that um, the phone has to uh, send the signal on. I'll connect it direct. No. So with uh, with the host, I sent to uh, flew to Jennifer and um, I met with Tim. This was important uh, for me because. Um, uh because he tell, told us uh yeah you're right if you're i can come to the same conclusion we can still do this however the window of opportunity is closing rapidly so we must to remove this 1500 gigaton you know because there's cascading tipping points no, changes in the climate system like uh, uh, arctic ice melting and, and stuff like that that will lead to other changes uh, we have to be fast because it's 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 all uh, happening way faster than we thought. So we have to start now. We, so, so so we said, let, okay, let's start going then. And at the same time, uh, uh, our 
first son of the noir novel. And I thought, like, what would tell them, you know? So it's interesting, actually, what happens um, because we're we are meeting now increasingly people who has, have made this decision. Like, if we have now ten years to 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 um, to change course, why work on anything else? What's even the point in it? I mean, either you go just go right out party and drink till your till the uh, till the end. Or you just start working on it, and if you make that decision and and you start, you know, meeting other people who actually on in also did made the same decision, then you are with a very very nice group of determined uh, um, uh, people who. Uh, I mean, we are not looking for uh, meaning in our lives or something like that. I mean, that becomes ridiculous. Of course, this is a meaning. We're building a new economy that will actually recreate a future for our kids. So th those were kind of kind of things that led to that. And in combination with a, you know, a big, great, great group of people who, um, uh, who, uh, whom we start to 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 connect together and just, you know, uh, just just start. That's beautiful. That's beautiful that you you felt this urgency to to do something. And actually, I want to go deeper into your work. So I want to ask you, uh, what are in in details these natural climate solutions that you are talking about? So the olivine, the seaweed, and the agroforestry. Can you talk to us a little bit about it? Sure. So it's about the oceans, the land, and uh, construction. Basically, like olivine is like a construction material, and there's other things like buildings. There's uh, uh, there's everything we do on the land, and we say regenerative agriculture, uh, agriculture uh, or agroforestry, because that's a nice way of uh, putting the land to to systemic use to to do many things at the same time you know bring back nature uh, and and the oceans the oceans are the big like uh elephants in the room there we we haven't been looking at the oceans so much uh well they've been saving saving us from great disaster because they sucked up most of the carbon dioxide and um and there's a there's there's a huge opportunity for um for the solutions i'll start with the oceans for that reason because they they are they have been overlooked and especially the coastal areas. My dear colleague uh, Ilko Lehmans um, is our chief of oceans, and he could could do a much better job at uh, giving this description. But I I start with the um, uh, also in in Tim Flannery's work again. Um, he he quotes research saying that if we put nine percent of the oceans into productive use for seaweed then we can um, uh, sequester all the carbon uh, uh, and, uh, and reverse climate change. 9% is a lot, but we don't need only the oceans and we don't need only seaweed. It's just to give an order of magnitude idea. It can be done, right? So the potential of the oceans is just fantastic. And if, uh, you know, if you start planting more trees, then the question is, where are you going to do it? You need land. This land is someone's land. You need to change ownership for the land. Where are you going to put your uh, your crops, your food production? So there's all questions that make it um, challenging to plant trees, um, which is great, planting trees. Um, but on the oceans, we don't have those issues. You don't need, you don't need fresh water to grow, grow things on the oceans. You don't need uh, fences. You don't need a specific ownership. You don't need... So there's a vast, really vast opportunity also from these uh, aspects. And then there's all the really, if you go deeper, I mean, seaweed is just a way of saying, hey, there's this thing that grows up to 60 centimeters a day. Huh? If you look in kelp uh, seaweeds, they really grow like five times as fast as plants on land about. Um, but there's also all the smaller anim animals. And this is where distributed scaling comes in again, because all those small small animals, plants and animals, um, 
if we make sure that they that they uh, get thriving conditions again, then um, then they can always also grow and uh, 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 what grows in the ocean uh, ends on the bottom and it stores carbon the, the carbon there. It can also be in the form of a whale, for example. You know, we slashed the number of whales on the ocean by about 90%, 90%, about in my lifetime. Um, uh, so, it, so bringing back whales into the ocean, they are super big. They're big buddies, store a lot of carbon. Carbon is the building block of life. So end of life of the, uh, uh, or, or through their, um, uh, their poop, whales can seriously uh, uh, restart this carbon cycle and sequester carbon dioxide, remove carbon. Um, and then there's the coastal areas where there's mangrove forests, seagrass, all kind of life, really bring, bringing, um, preserving and bringing back life in those coastal areas is like a massive opportunity. This is the oceans. Are we doing good? Yeah. Yeah, in time, we can go to the land. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, because on the land, we, so, we also start growing our, our resources. Well, but we, but we can also do it on the oceans, by the way. It's, it's, too, it's also a resource for all kinds of different things. On land, we also look for those multipotent solutions. So trees, but where and when, and hey, can we do trees where we also produce food? There's a food forest. Hey, can we do trees in uh, pastures where cattle graze. Can we do that? And then you go back a hundred years and you say, hey, that's actually like it, like it has been all that time. And then came Western uh, uh, agriculture and we said all those fields, you know, African fields and everywhere, slash those trees. And only now we start realizing that those trees, when they grow their roots into the soil, they are this interface be between the atmosphere and what goes on in the soil, which is also an, an abundance of life when things are um, in balance. So we look for those combinations and the regenerative agroforestry is a wonderful opportunity because it's um, a way of producing food uh, and creating ecosystems that bring back life, you know, biodiversity. Uh, my dear colleague Lin Linda says, and nature is doing really bad, really bad. Insect populations have been slashed, like 70% of the insects were gone, All, also gone. That's amazing. So bringing back life and insects and all the critzling creatures and, uh, and the, the uh, but also the fungi and the, the, and all the bacteria, those are all kingdoms of life in their own way. Once you start opening up to that, then it becomes a no-brainer. Of course, we're gonna do regenerative agroforestry. Hey, you don't need fertilizer for that, uh, um, uh, artificial fertilizer. Um, so why is that happening? Who are selling that artificial fertilizer? Hey, that's interesting. They're made from natural gas. So oil and gas industry has a big problem when we go off artificial fertilizer. Hmm, that's interesting. Where did we see that again? You know, at the energy transition. So there, there's this, um, uh, this uh, blocks of uh, vested interests were really, really uh, strong and that are actually mostly left out of the, uh, of the equation um, because when these, when we say it's sensitive, but we say, we think that if we look at the people who are working in those vested interests, you know, the farmers who currently are farming our land, they don't want to kill the land. If you, if they would be, would have a feasible, if there would be a feasible business model in regenerative agroforestry, instead of uh, fertilizer and killing, killing all the land, um, you know, in, in the, the green desert, we call it in, 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 in much of Europe. Not a worm lives in those farmlands right now. So changing our farmlands um, uh, and being very smart in uh, dealing with the vested interests and working with the people uh, instead of with, with those vested interest organizations, it's a super opportunity. Yeah, these solutions are amazing, but 
what I find really strange is that I discovered through your website actually that uh, natural climate solutions are heavily underfunded and even if they can provide over 30% of the solution to climate change, they receive just the 3% of funding. So this is a really interesting information. And since you claim that they are so powerful, why do you think these solutions are at the same time so underfunded? So yeah. why are, aren't governments or people committing to, to these solutions if they are so, so useful? Yeah, good question. Um, well, um, uh, a couple of those, a couple of, of, of these solutions, they require, um, uh, they just require us to do other things, right? To do new things. That's not a problem. But other um, uh, set of solutions require us to um, change business models of very large industries. And those large industries, they, um, they, uh, uh, they are not going to give, uh, give away because we are connected to those industries as well, through our pensions, through our, um, uh, uh, all many things we do, our food system, whatever. So, um, so there's, there's a reason that they're underfunded is there, that um, we need to see that and then just make the decision to, are we going for the future or are we going for destruction? And given the right uh, question, uh, politicians, but also voters will, will give an obvious answer. Of course, we'll go for, for life and the future. Um, so we're not asking the right question. So we should ask th th this question, like how do we uh, work with vested interests to go to change the economy as fast as possible by building something that's actually better than we have now. That's one. The other is, if you specifically look at native-based solutions, um, uh, you know, uh, intellectual property, IP, so the patents, the, the, uh, the, um, the rights to you, the, yeah, the rights you can, can uh, uh, the legal right to use an idea, intellectual property. For a technological solutions, that's quite easy. You say, okay, I've got this brilliant new solar panel design or uh, I go to the patent office and I've got my intellectual property. Then you go to an investor, you say, hey, you give me, you give me 10 million to build my factory or 100 million. They say, okay, but how do you shy away from competitors? And you say, I've got this IP. I've got this intellectual property in the patent bureau. Um, now so and then you're good you get your you get your uh, 100 million and you can build your factory or your system whatever now you're working on nature based solutions and you go to the patent bureau and you say um hey i've got this thing it's a tree can i get intellectual property on that it's a different question or the answer is different and then you go to your investor and you say, I've got this brilliant idea for hundred for hundred million, we can build this whole new economy, build a new, a new nature based, uh, new nature economy. Uh, World Economic Forum likes it and uh, it's based on a tree or on miscanthus, which is this grass that's growing very rapidly or on olivine or on seaweed. And then this investor says, uh, okay, but um, how do you shy away from, how do you protect from comp competition? And you say, I couldn't, I can't have IP. So that's another reason that um, to get major investments in, it's uh, harder to, um, to get the first, uh, um, uh, to get the ball, a ball moving because it's more difficult to get in the yeah, like the old economy investment uh, uh, systems, because it's harder to get IP on nature. And maybe speaking about politics, we all know that from like a practical point of view, all the solutions must be taken by the political sector and that politicians are really hard to convince, in particular when it's all about money, uh, investments and hard commitment to a specific topic as the climate crisis is. So my, my question would be, how are you trying to translate your vision into a policy proposal to the policymakers? And how did the, poli the political system reacted to your proposals? Yeah. 
Well, first by moving from uh, I to we. So the mostly, really, if you ask like, what do you do about climate change? So uh, what are the solutions and what do you say? Okay, I start, right? I start, okay, changing my light bulbs. I make my personal footprint. Um, I start, uh, uh, I wanna drive less. I wanna, it's all about individual choices, you know? But why? You know, it, tur it turns out that um, the idea of the individual footprint was introduced by British Petroleum somewhere in the 2000s. So why would they do that? If you look now at the messaging of uh, uh, Shell uh, oil, for example, Royal Dutch Shell, as they say, it's all about individual choice. They say, yeah, we can change the company, but consumers have uh, uh, asked for our products. So it's an individual choice. And um, so first of all, what, needs, what, um, what we think that needs to happen is we, we realize that, as, um, that we only can be successful, uh, that we are successful. No, we know we are successful if we uh, work collectively. And that means through policy, because we've got those wonderful collective systems. We, it seems we have forgotten about them even which are the legal system, um, our political, we just had elections. It is the most fantastic thing there is. We've got a structure where we've got, in, in the case of the Netherlands, 17, 000, uh, 17 million people who all have different opinions. And we have a system where we don't fight each other with knives and swords, but we, uh, uh, we discuss. And, you know, the, the, the big companies, they are well, um, uh, they know this very well. And everyone involves it. So there's armies of, lo of lobbyists who go to the politicians, but we can do that as well. You and me, we can say, okay, we are European citizens. We can do a citizens initiative at the European Union. European policy is super effective, super effective. There's all kind of nature being saved by European policy. It just has a bad name. But it works fantastic. So by by just using those structures and not being blinded by this kind of individual responsibility nonsense, we are responsibility to responsible. Our responsibility is to collaborate. That's all. Yeah. That's all. Uh, in order to to put pressure on the political sector, um, in your opinion, so we need to collaborate and cooperate like the individuals have to do it but maybe it's just sometimes um even if you're in your work um you are treating complex informations and complex uh theories so what are the best ways to communicate these informations um what are the the, the difficulties that you encountered Um, the difficulty is that people make it complex. And there's a this, this is also a deliberative, a deliberate strategy. Um, if you want to want to stop change, you just say it is complex. Just m if you start minding the language uh, in the debate, you will hear this quite often, like, no, it's complicated. And so a way around that is, we call it layer, adding layers of simplicity. We just say, no, it's not. We've been moving into, I haven't discussed it. Uh, so we've got the oceans and the land and then there's construction like buildings and, and structures and roads um, that are big emitters now and they should be um, uh, carbon sinks, they should be storing carbon and this can be done simply build making your house out of wood haven't we been doing that for a couple for thousands of years then the house stores carbon so it's an actually regenerative structure instead of something made of concrete which is like at least two uh, uh, double uh, emits double what we emit with from uh, airplanes 
flying him, it's just half of the, what, what, what just concrete does. Construction sector is major. Um, so, um, so what's the simplicity here? The simplicity is first this, hey, a wooden house stores carbon or a bio-based house, you know, from hemp or whatever there's, there's there, the materials are there. It's just that there's huge vested interests who make it com complex. So I actually, I don't agree that it's complex. The whole system of change is complex, but the actual solutions, they are not. It's just, and in the construction sector, we recently, we just made a very simple calculation tool in two or three months time, where you can see how much CO2 is in a uh, a bio-based building where you can choose materials and you can just compare and it's just well there's carbon there's carbon in it and you just count up the, the molecules and also that is simple if you've got like a kilo of wood or a, a thousand kilo a ton of wood um, then you can just weigh that you look in a very simple uh, 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 database very simple just um, if you know that there's that you have one kilo of wood, then the amount of carbon is 700 grams, or about, depending on the on the on the carbon dioxide. On the so that's a very simple database lookup, and so it's very easy to calculate how much CO2 is actually stored in your building. So just make it simple, and then put that to politics and. That's what's happening now. You know, there's some municipalities who are now taking it up, and then then the big resistance will come. But then, um, so in your personal experience, how are you trying to simplify your your work in order to communicate it to people and try to to involve them in this like community feeling? To, to act against climate change and trying to reverse it? Um, well, a very simple thing is um, the club. We've got the 1500 club, remove 1500 gigaton, come together with 1500 people. Um, double nature is one. 1500 gigaton is, is, that's not simple because what's a gigaton? How do you envision that? Where do you start? Double nature is simple. You see, you know, you see one tree, what is needed actually physically on the planet, we need two of them instead of one, double nature. We need not the amount of, of, of mangroves in the oceans that we have now. We need, we need them to double. So that's a layer of simplicity, an example. Of that. And it counts up because it's really that all plants and trees on earth contain 1500 kiloton of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Start from data, I make it simple. Yeah, I was wondering also that, in a sense, like a circular economy can allow to clean up our world from materials and pollutants, which are uh, threatening human human life and um, ecosystem. In what sense you are cleaning up the climate, which is something that we have never heard. Well, we are cleaning the air uh, from carbon dioxide. Um, that's a simple one. Remove okay. carbon and, and, and get it stored. It's also about cleaning up our thinking, right? For, to get all this complexity and, and, and all these conflicting messages out of there. And um, another inspiration was that that uh, our uh, our first uh, son, Lovell, he's five now. Um, when he was very young, he just liked to clean things up, you know, to uh, to make things kind of neat again. To he liked that when he was very very young. So he thought. So I thought, well, maybe it's something something that people actually like like to do, you know, to to get your act together, to have your things sorted out. I mean, if you look in your room now behind you, there's nice painting. You, you, it's nice to make your surroundings look nice, which is some kind of order. We feel good about that. 
yeah. So it's also about about that, about getting our relationship with nature back in order and cle cleaning that up, cleaning all the all the old baggage. We've been we've been sucking the world, uh, uh, sucking out life from the world, so sucking up oil from the deeps, from the belly of the earth. We've been doing all those things. We're still doing it at, at way at at at, at, sp at staggering speeds. So we need to get clear with that. Yeah. And personally, we, personally, I find we, yeah. 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 I was saying that personally, I find really motivating and uh, and sh shareable your thoughts, and I'm really into it. But I imagine that there are many people that maybe then do not uh, agree with you. So how can we talk to people who do not believe in this? The funny thing is we don't get get that too much with this um, uh, with this approach. We don't get people who say, "Oh, that's totally that total nonsense." I never hear that. Or no, we should we or or no, we shouldn't bring back life to our landscape. No one. Even farmers, if you ask a farmer, like, do you want to do we want to kill the land, uh, or do you want to bring back life? So we don't get that too much um, right now. Um, it's by getting back to this um, uh, to this point, like the essence if, is actually regeneration, right? Double nature. So, which is the difference between do you want to uh, you want your impact on the world? Do you want to be that to be towards death? Or do you want that to be towards life? And if you bring it back to that question, and hey, do you want to be alone or you want to do, do you want to work together? If you bring it back to that question, then there is no, um, there can be no opposition. Or there can be, um, which could be uh, cynicism. There could be cynicism. Okay, so but we are in the last ten minutes. Choice. That's a choice to be to be cynical or not to be cynical, and we choose um, to be uh, to be positive. That's that's really nice that you are you are thinking like, about this in this way, and um, so we are in the last ten minutes, and we have one question for from the chat, and actually it's from from john and we are interviewing him on sunday oh, great. so yeah and he asked you how best to overcome the pushback so the resistance from vested interests is it possible on some level to work with them um yes on all levels first of all um who is them so there's vested interests who are institutions and there are um the people working at those institutions for example let's go someone working as an oil company um i've got a nephew who's working at an oil company you know he's the nicest person you can you can think of so is it about the institutions or the people that's that's a really first um uh, a question that helps me a lot in this um, uh, in, in this question, um, and then there is uh, using our um, our democratic institutions, which uh, which is helpful, invest interest, and you know there's a big change huh, because there from um, from uh, from the fin financial sector, uh, most prominently, but th there's one set one central question being asked now, and that's what's the risk of doing nothing? And this question is changing everything. It changed. It, it uh, perhaps it enabled um, enabled the Paris Agreement. This question: What's the risk of doing nothing? 
because uh, for example insurance companies who have a lot of assets that are they also in investing they were very good in the, at this question at, at thinking about risk so if you ask a financial like what's the risk of doing nothing what's the risk of burning all this carbon what will this mean um, then you get very interesting answers um, and because of this mechanism now um, even the biggest investment firm of the world blackrock they have nine thousand billion under uh, assets under management i think they just breached the nine thousand barrier it's unimaginable i have to think about this staggering numbers all the time to get them right um they uh, are now uh, at least very vocal about this climate risk and they are starting to get vocal on those climate opportunities of this new nature economy opportunities so that's another one that facet interests are also in the system and the leverage points in that system um, might be at unexpected uh, places and the financial sector is one of those unexpected places so we have also feedback from John and he said that he could not agree more with you. Oh, right? okay. <laughs> well, there's, there's no debates. That's boring. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we came to the end and it was a pleasure to talk with you, Sven. Your contribution were absolutely amazing and I'm really happy I've had the opportunity to talk with you tonight. So thank you again. Thank you, uh, Christian. It was uh, my pleasure.